Hi, welcome to episode zero of the Namespace podcast. I'm Derek and I'm here with my co-host Jordan. I'm Jordan. And uh, today we just want to talk about what we want to get out of the podcast, what you're going to learn in the podcast, give you a little introduction into who we are and how we became software engineers. So Jordan, you have a pretty interesting history with that. So I think at least go ahead and give us the lowdown. All right. So, uh, so my name is Jordan, and I went to school at the University of Texas, and I did not study computer science. I studied biochemistry. Um, while I was in school is when I discovered computer science. I took a programming course and just decided that that's what I wanted to do. Um, it felt like a path that I could really succeed in, much more than in biochemistry, which was always kind of confusing, but programming really stuck with me. So... Um, in college, I did a lot of side projects and really built up credibility. And then I started working as a software developer in Austin, Texas. And that is how I met Derek. Um, so Derek, why don't you go ahead and share some of your story? Yeah, I mean, I had a, a long winding history to get here. Uh, wanted to be a chef for a long time, got into computer repair, decided I was really good at calculus, uh, business calculus went and did a computer engineering degree, found out I was really bad at calculus. Uh, and then a friend of mine uh, recruited me into the computer science program, which is how I ended up with a, a CS degree. Uh, landed an internship uh, doing software development where I was basically everything, VP of engineering, director of engineering, software engineer, database admin, uh, which was a lot of fun, uh, but really kind of sucked because there was nobody to learn from. Uh, except the internet and uh, finally graduated, moved on from there to a company called Trader Interactive. Uh, they run a bunch of sites like Commercial Truck Trader, Cycle Trader, RV Trader, uh, and I did some ETL development for them. Uh, left there, started in Austin, Texas at a company called Silence. It's a next gen antivirus uh, producer and uh, yeah, that's that's where we met, and I've just been doing some uh, more full stack development for them. Yep. So that's a little bit about us, and now we'd like to talk about our vision for the podcast. So it's called Namespace Podcast, and uh, my well, initial thought... Maybe we should talk about why it's Namespace Podcast. Sure, you, you go ahead and you explain it then, because you came up with it, which I think is great. Okay, so... Uh, with any engineer, we of course want to show how clever we are in naming everything. And so <laughs> Jordan and I tossed around some names uh, and like there was a few that neither of us really liked. And then there was one um, that was pretty obscure and dealt with like concatenating Latin words uh, that kind of grew on us. We we're like, oh yeah, this is really cool. But no one would know how to pronounce it just from reading it. Yeah, no, nobody would know how <laughs> to spell codificare. Nobody would know what it meant. And uh, we, we want you to interact with us. So the email is namespace.pod at gmail instead of codificare. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, but at, at one point, we, we had also not really decided what we were talking about uh, yeah, kind of very generally we had. So it's like, well, what if we did name and then blank, blank, blank podcast and it's name space, like name spaces and a bunch of coding languages. Uh, and eventually we kind of settled like, we're going to get rid of this, the blanks because we're not planning on changing it anymore. It's just going to be the, the name space podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty, again, we want people to know how to say it. So yeah. name space podcast. And, um, we're, we're basically, we're just here because we, we really love talking about software engineering and we like talking about new technologies and how to use cool technologies and how to build projects correctly and how to do... Yeah, that's important. Correctly. <laughs> uh, just how to do your, how to really follow good practices. And so we, we figured while we're doing all of this research to figure out how we can be the best software developers we can be, why not share that knowledge with whoever wants to listen to what we find out and what we've been working on and uh, just our experience with what are the best practices for making projects and learning about computer science and teaching computer science. Yeah, so we, we have a couple of formats that we're, we're going to play around with uh, as things get started. So general discussions, kind of like what we're going to be doing today. 
uh, we're both very fortunate to know some very uh, prominent people like, oh, I say he's the best iOS developer in Austin and uh, he's agreed to come do an interview with us already. So we're going to have some interviews with people. Uh, we're we're going to have informational ones too, where we actually will play around with a concept or an idea and report some findings and how we did it. Uh, and then we're going to also cover like the history of computer science and why things have become the way they are. Uh, there, there's others that I consider like philosophers high tea, uh, which is things like tackling things uh, like the, the gender wage gap. Like what would we do or what do we think could help with that? Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a pretty current topic right now and one that's fairly important and that we're both interested in. Uh, so that's, that's some of the things we're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but what like what do you want to see the happen with the podcast? What would you, be your goals for everybody tuning in? Well, another thing that I think um, really struck me with uh, coming up with this idea was that one quote that the a really great architect we both know mentioned to us. I forget who actually originated the quote, but the the quote is. They call it computer science, but there's nothing scientific about it. And that for me, it really struck true. And also I feel like that's something that Derek and I are trying to, um, I guess, overcome within the industry is making it more scientific and coming up with actual processes and platforms to share knowledge and come up with best practices and just discuss them. So that's kind of what I want to see is I want people to tune in and um, get a feel for what we think is the best way to do computer science. And then we want you to email us and reach out to us on social media and tell us what you what you think about our opinions and how we want to be able to make this a conversation. Definitely that point. We want it to be a conversation. Uh you know, best practices are quite often uh, opinion based and people will have varying opinions for varying reasons. We want to hear those as well because uh, there, there's things that we're not going to consider as well. Uh, but along the same vein, sa same architect, uh, very similar quote said, there's a better way to do engineering. And that is the, the bit that struck very true to me because uh, I got frustrated, like working on these projects. And I'm like, why are we making these mistakes again? Like come on guys uh and so for me i'm very passionate about like how do i teach the best practices and uh instill the discipline of good code craft to people uh so a little bit of this is i want to hear from all of you knowing that there's other people that feel the same way i want those people to know there's other people out there that feel the same way as you do and just offer encouragement, advice, and resources on how you can actually produce the best code out there. Uh, and so that's kind of where I would like to see, or that's where I want to see it go. That's what I want you all to get out of this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one other point on that is uh, the reason why we decided to do a podcast, I think is pretty interesting. Well, for me, I, I want to do a podcast because... Um, there's so many resources for learning computer science and so many um, tutorials, like really long videos and great articles. But I felt like um, a platform where where we can just uh, talk about it and you guys can be driving in your car or in the shower. And I felt like it would be a really interesting way to share ideas. Do and people really listen to podcasts in the shower. I do. <laughs> I still don't buy that car. I get background noise while you're at work. I get cooking. I get <laughs> I take really long showers. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Uh, Moving on. Moving on. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, just again, for some more introduction, we're going to share some interesting facts that we have talked about. Yeah. Um, so th this is just a good way to learn some of our interests we feel like uh feel free to reach out to us let us know what your interests are you know your answers to these questions uh so jordan like what's one technology you want to be working with in the future what are you really excited about 
So for me, the next technology I want to start messing around with is Go. Um, I've been coding with a lot of Python lately, and I know Go is a very Python-based in its syntax, so it seems like it would be a really great transition. Um, and also, everyone's just talking about it online <laughs> in the articles I read. It seems like a an interesting way to um, think about software because I mean go they try and get you to use the language without any frameworks like you build your own framework and that's really interesting to me and the no objects just structures and interfaces is also very interesting but ties back to object-oriented programming even though there's no objects so I'm like oh that sounds really cool I want to check it out so that's that's for me where I'm trying to go next um, delve into some go and maybe we should at some point do a history topic on it because back before there's OO languages like in C you had structs and mm -hmm. structs were how you managed objects and in higher level languages an object is really just wrapping around the manually allocating memory and stuff of a struct they're still structs yeah so it, it would be kind of interesting to do the whole life cycle of how that I don't know very much about Go yet uh, but yeah. it's, it's one of those that I want to explore as well but the one that I'm most excited for, uh, and I have been for several years, and I've just I've never had a good use for it yet, is GraphQL. I, I've done a lot of APIs, and the fact that GraphQL lets you request in the same format that your data is coming back to solves all sorts of problems. Uh, that it can hit like multiple endpoints is just it just seems lovely. Uh, I'm really excited to start playing with it and see if it lives up to my expectations but i have a feeling it will cool sounds sounds good i also haven't messed around with graphql i've heard a lot about it but haven't yeah. played with it it's good stuff uh designed by facebook i know i went to a talk the the talk that got me really interested was uh done by some github developers mm -hmm. and they talked about how they swapped out the the rest api with a, a graphql layer in front of it and like with zero downtime and I was just like, whoa, <laughs> I want to do this. Um, so anyhow, uh, but other side of the coin now, uh, what's a while back, Elon Musk, we all love Elon, <laughs> uh, said, tweeted, I, I think it was that he was going to buy Fortnite and shut it down. Uh, so if, you know, when you're a billionaire, what technology would you buy just to shut down as a publicity stunt? Right. Um, so so for me, I, I had to think pretty hard to come up with uh, a technology I hated enough. Derek couldn't uh, pick his one that he hated the most. <laughs> so this is really a question for Derek. But for me, what I came up with uh, is Microsoft Access. I'll, I guess I'll have to buy all of Microsoft. But maybe it will be worth it because... Uh, we should all be moving forward, <laughs> I mean, to at least a server database, if not be on the cloud. I mean, access, it's so, uh, just whenever I go around and mess with it, it's like, I mean, it's like Microsoft Word. It's for, it's for people who are just hanging out on their computers, making notes or something. It's not for companies <laughs> anymore. Yeah, man, I thought access was dead, like, years ago. What? When I was an intern, my first project was migrating off of an Access database to SQL Server. And I think it was SQL Server 2008. And so I thought 2008 was like, Access is dead. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I feel like Access probably doesn't get security patches, so you should get off of it. Yeah, it should be dead. Uh, yeah, thanks for making me seem like... A negative Nancy. <laughs> no, it's but not about there, there was a list of technologies that I have frustrations <laughs> with. And s most of these were current. Um, but I think what's topping the list right now, and it's just because it's the one I like using least, is Kibana. Uh, I have my issues with Elasticsearch, but that's because I haven't used it under a good use case. Uh, there are good use cases, and I just haven't used it yet. But Kibana is just so unintuitive. Like you get in there and you start trying to query stuff. And well, unless you have just intimate knowledge of the system and the data you're working with, it's just so unwelcoming. And I would, yeah, I don't I like Kibana I haven't even heard right of now. Kibana. It's visualization for Elasticsearch. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't used Elasticsearch it's, either, so. It's all right. Uh, yeah, that, that's the one right now. <laughs> Cabana. Gotcha. Don't like it. Okay, so let's see. We're Next, we're going to talk about um, something that we learned in computer science and how it surprised us. So, um, Derek, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. So, I, I did computer repair for a lot of years, and um, nothing... I, I feel like I had a good conceptual understanding of it. Uh, and I'm actually going to switch the answer from what I told Jordan I was going to say earlier mm-hmm. today. Um, but in Windows, and I don't even know if a, a modern like Windows 10 does it, but back in Windows XP Vista days, uh, there, there's a very important file called the page, the page file. Yeah. Uh, and if anybody is familiar with paging, uh, and if you went through and got a traditional computer science degree, you are, uh, it's, it's all about, uh, storing things in memory, uh, that are going to be used again. Uh, but you only have a limited amount of space. So at some point you have to swap that out with what's on the disc. And I conceptually knew what the page file did in windows and why I needed to set it to a certain max size and min size based on how much Ram was available and all that stuff. Uh, But when I actually took my OS course where we went in depth to paging uh, and all the different applications of that, uh, that was just like, wow, conceptually, I knew what it did and I was right. But knowing how it works now, like, wow, (laughs) that's super intricate. Uh, So I I was going to talk about file extensions, um, and that's just kind of a boring one (laughs) comparatively. Well, I don't know how the paging works at all. So I guess if you're interested, go ahead and look it up. Sounds like it blew Derek or away. Or email us and we'll do a topic on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Email we'll us if you really topic. care. Okay. Um, so yeah. for me, uh, something that I read about that I thought was super cool, and I actually forget which company does this, but it was a method for determining if a username is already taken because... Um, I mean, when you think about it, if someone's like creating a username very, I mean, very simply, it's like, oh, we'll just check every single username and see if it is one of those. And if it isn't, uh, then go ahead and use it. But that's just terrible. Um, That doesn't scale. That doesn't. Yeah, that doesn't scale. So there's really, I, you really can't do it like that. So there has to be another way. And the way that I read about, which I thought was really interesting is that you have um, all of your usernames that are already created stored in a bunch of trees. So you have a tree for each letter, right? And then um, the second node in the tree will be the second letter in the username. And the third node is the third letter of the username. And what happens whenever a user is creating a new username is for each letter you type, um, you're recursing or what's it you're called? You're just navigating down the tree. You're just navigating. You're just navigating down the tree. And, um, if you, if someone has the username and you hit the ends of all the trees and that username hasn't been used yet, uh, then, then you can use it. And that, that to me was really interesting cause it scales wonderfully. Like there's nothing like iterating through every username. And I thought it was a really cool way to, to think about that problem. Um, so yeah, for me, that was a fun one. Trees are awesome. I like trees. Uh, so let, let's get into a little bit more rapid fire here, um, okay. which I know we like to talk and we're very verbose. So we'll see how quick we are with this. Uh, first programming language you learned? Python. Okay. okay. For me, it was Java. All right. And, was- and I guess my quick note, we've talked about this before. Python might not be the best first programming language. It's really fun and it makes you feel like you're really good because it's very quick and easy. But then if you try to jump from Python to another language, um, sometimes it can be difficult because most other languages include many more features than Python does. Python is kind of like condenses programming language into... um, It's interesting you call those features. Features? Um, (laughs) Yeah. Technically, yes. I kind of think of them as safety wheels. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, yeah. I recommend statically or strongly type static languages like C sharp, Java, uh, Rust is another one. I, again, don't know too much about it, but uh, they have 
all of these restrictions that you have to understand uh, the, the concept of actual private, which Python doesn't have. Right. You can't have private uh, properties or uh, methods. Or interfaces. Yep, it doesn't really have uh, interfaces built in the language. You have a, a add-on to the standard library for that. Uh, but when you learn Python, you don't learn how to work within all those restrictions uh, and if you learn one of those other languages first, when you move on to something like Python, uh, you can appreciate all the things that you're allowed to do now, but you also have been forced to understand why you do things that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it gives you the freedom to break the rules when it makes sense. Uh, where right. C sharp, you just can't break the rules. The code doesn't compile. Yeah, and with Python, if it's your first language, you're you're breaking rules you didn't even know existed until you move on, and then you're like, oh well, I can't do things the way I'm used to. I have to figure out how to just think about code differently. Really. Yep. Anyway, favorite programming language. Right now, it's definitely Python. Mm -hmm. uh, C Sharp, especially with the whole .NET Core framework coming out, uh, holds a, a dear place in my heart. But if I have to start a new project, I'm starting it in Python. Yes, Python for me as well. F favorite programming language. Uh, okay, so we kind of already know this for you. Your next language is going to be Go. Yes. Sounds like. Uh, for me, probably Go or Rust. Mm -hmm. I think one of those two would... Uh, would be great to add to the toolbox and very interesting to learn. Yeah, Rust is one I haven't heard of, but we'll definitely, we'll do a topic that's just talking about programming languages at some point. Just like our favorite ones, good ones you think you should, right. we think you should learn or good intro ones. Well, we're going to have so many topics for you guys. <laughs> yeah, okay. but we just love talking. It's amazing. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Are you worried about AI? What it's going to do for us in the future? Uh, no, I am not. I'm yeah. not worried. Um. I'm not really worried either. Yeah, I mentioned it to Derek, but just because an AI knows what kind, what size shirt I might wear at uh, Free People or something, it doesn't mean that it's going to take over the world. Yeah. Uh, so I read an article a while back, and I, I can't find the the link to it. I don't know the author or the name of it, but it took like three or four days to read, uh, and it was very insightful, but. One of the first things that they came out and said was uh, to get an AI that can compute at normal human brain functionality speeds, uh, you need to consume more power than the Earth produces and you need wow. more room than there is available on the Earth. And uh, so the, the hardware isn't there yet. So I'm not worried about it uh, in my lifetime, but I'm also not too worried about it in my children's lifetime or you know, anybody's at this point because uh, it's very specialized AI and not mm -hmm. a generalized AI. Like Jordan was saying, just because it knows your T-shirt size doesn't mean it knows how to launch nukes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so right, right now, it's not something that I'm I'm too concerned about. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, <laughs> favorite exploit scene in a movie where they got the jargon right, but they missed the whole point. Right. So... <laughs> uh, it deserves an honorable mention in CSI Miami. Uh, at one point, one of the characters comes up and says, I'm going to create a virtual machine out of visual basic to track their IP address. And you, it just, you're like, no, that doesn't work. That's not how any of that works. Uh, Good try though. Yeah. Honorable mention. <laughs> I love that, that part. Uh, yeah. But th the best one was in the latest born movie. I think it was just called Jason Bourne movie opens it's in like this dark room hacker den type thing for lack of better words everybody's talking like russian or something and the subtitles of the film uh li literally say uh corrupt their database with sequel spelled out sql <laughs> and in the movie theater i just out loud go ah! <laughs> and um just like, well, you're not wrong. <laughs> and I yeah. just thought that was just too funny. Yeah, that's um, really great. Yeah. I, God, I love those movies so much. <laughs> that was so good. Uh, but I'm going to watch it just for that. You should. Uh, <laughs> so that was my favorite exploit in a movie. Do you have one? 
Uh, not really. I mean, the one that I thought of is um, not necessarily computer science related, but it's the the new Annihilation movie. Um, that one is has got a lot of chemistry, biochemistry, biology, which that's my degree. So, of course, people are mentioning all the jargony terms within that field. And um, again, it's like when they're talking about like DNA mutation type terms, it's like, sure, like they're saying uh, proper terminology, but the way that they are um, describing it was just to me um, pretty funny and pretty ridiculous at times. Like um, the the assumptions that are made that these yeah. are how things are working. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So on, on that note, a little bit of a plug here, not really a plug. So I'm not going to mention a company uh, at the beginning of, 2019, I got this awesome opportunity to consult on a security training video, uh, and I actually got to help write the script and probably the most entertaining, fun, enjoyable project and group of people I've ever gotten to work with. Uh, but Hollywood, if you're hearing this, I, I do consultations on scripts. Email us namespace.pod at gmail.com. <laughs> there's there's our plug. <laughs> Very cool. We will help out. Uh, okay. Uh, sequel versus no sequel. I like sequel. Why? <laughs> because I know how to organize tables. <laughs> yeah, I know how to organize tables in no sequel as well. There are none. <laughs> Yeah, with NoSQL for me, I just don't have experience. Like, I've tried to use NoSQL databases, and it just feels messy because I don't, I haven't done very much research into how to organize a NoSQL database. But of course, like, I know so much about table normalization with relational tables. It's like, so I can, I, it feels cleaner. Yeah. Uh, jo so Jordan and I are both very organized people. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the reasons we, we get along. And, uh, uh, I, I kind of share the same with it, but I have gotten to work with the NoSQL database and I really enjoyed it for the mm -hmm. use case. Um, if I had to do everything over again, I would probably still stick with NoSQL. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah. that's walking a very fine line. Like there's times NoSQL works and there's times that it doesn't. Uh, and we will I, talk about those yeah. times we were going to have a whole episode on this topic because it's something that I've been wanting to research more which use cases are good for which one and like how to uh, properly organize the uh, well all the normalization stuff with relational databases is more known to me but the NoSQL that's I need to do research and we'll talk about it yeah we'll we'll cover all that mm -hmm. uh, but you know what we also like to kick up dirt and you know Start the flame war. So we're just going to go ahead and cover this topic. Vim versus Emacs. I will say Vim because I've never used Emacs. And uh, yeah, no problems with Vim so far. It's... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> same Vim. I've never used Emacs. So I don't get this question, but I know some people get heated about it. Uh, how about tabs versus spaces? Spaces. Yeah, spaces. Every IDE now will convert a tab to two, four, three, whatever, however many number of spaces. Uh, but a, a fun anecdote on that. Uh, there was one project I worked on that originally was started by a, a vice president or somebody of the, the company. Um, they like mm -hmm. shut themselves in their office, knocked out a bunch of code in a week and it's like, ta-da, here's the product. Uh, and then we took it on and developed it further than that. But he used tabs everywhere. And he even went to so far as to tell our manager that we should be using tabs for the uh, the project instead of spaces. But the rest of the engineers on the team were like, nah, -uh, we're not doing that. Um, and so one of our senior engineers was kind enough to grep the entire project and replace all tabs with four spaces <laughs> uh, which was phenomenal it was great uh, and very unfortunate for him because now his line shows up on every git blame yes <laughs> uh, so people ask him a lot of questions that he has no clue about because he did that for us um, I just thought that was really funny yeah that, that's a good story okay um, so how about this one is code self-documenting What's your opinion on that? <laughs> uh, so for me, I think that um, 
I mean, code can be over documented for sure. You don't have to explain why you did every single line in a code. But if there's something that um, you did and you the way that you coded it seems is prob- is like not intuitive because you're doing this workaround for this thing that this problem that somebody else found and you're if, if you need to explain that you did something in a weird way then certainly like you have to document that otherwise someone's just going to change it and you're going to end up with the same problem that is the problem you were fixing or whatever but i would say f- that um no you don't have to document everything if you write like really if you have a like, good names and then it should read pretty well yeah, so for me, uh, I think it was Martin Fowler that originally used this quote. Uh, I need to take a second to recall it exactly, but it's um, code, code that is self-documenting rarely is. I think that's, the, yeah, that's his quote. Uh, self-documented code rarely is. I add on to that. And developers who claim code is self-documented, documenting rarely write self-documenting code. Uh, yeah, it code tells you what it's doing and not why it's doing mm-hmm. it, and that's the whole point for a code comment. Uh, in the end, is there was something that needed to be done. It was maybe offbeat, like you were talking about, uh, to work around a very specific problem. And that is when a good code comment comes into play. Uh, you need to put that there so somebody understands the context of why you're doing something specifically. Uh, so no, code is not self-documenting. Cool. And email us if you disagree. We'll talk about it. <laughs> Jordan will. I will ignore you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mac versus Windows uh, for development. Well, okay. So if you put on that for development caveat, I'm going to say a, a Mac but I was a C sharp developer for many years and uh, I, I loved windows before that. Even when I was doing computer repair, I really defended it. There's even a time that I defended internet Explorer. Forgive me. <laughs> uh, but now that I have a work issued Mac and I've been playing around with it for like two years, I don't know that I could ever go back. So for development, I will say a Mac. Yeah, me me too. And for the same reason, when I was given a Mac for work, uh, I didn't like it at first because I didn't know what was going on. I've always used Windows. It was really difficult to get used to. But um, but but you get used to it really quickly. And then, yeah, now I'm like really tied down. I really like it. So um, right now, my personal computer at home is a Windows machine. But if if I have to get a new one, probably be a Mac. Oh, look at that. It's branching out. Yeah, trying new things. Okay, so for Python developers out there, because Jordan and I are both Python devs, mm-hmm. uh, VS Code versus PyCharm. I found that to be like a really hot topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I use VS Code. Uh, I, I think it's more versatile because whenever you are transitioning between multiple languages within a project or just different projects, uh, you can just stick to the same editor. And for me, I think that's that's a really huge benefit. You just get used to all the keyboard shortcuts and all the, um, just the layout and it's interchangeable. So I like it. I like it a lot for that reason. Layout's really nice. Uh, really, ni- <laughs> really nice. Yeah. The extension library is very well supported. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's got Microsoft behind it, of course, which helps having a huge backer like that. Uh, there's one big caveat you missed. Mm, what's that? Free 90 free. Free 90 free? Pie charm, you have to buy a license. Do you? For enterprise use. Oh, okay. And then for VS Code, it's just free. You okay. just get to use it. And I like free stuff. Well, there you go. It's it's 99, what is it? No, free 90 free. Free 90 free. It's, <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's my little joke. Haha, <laughs> everybody laugh. Okay, uh, last one real quick. GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket? Where are you going to host your repos? Well, um, before I started at this job I'm at right now, I've always I'd always used GitHub, so I liked GitHub a lot. It was the only one I had used, but after using Bitbucket for a while, um, I try and go back to my GitHub projects. It's kind of hard to figure out what I'm trying to click because I'm so used to Bitbucket now. Uh, so I like Bitbucket just because I'm more acclimated to it. Uh, and Derek is going to <laughs> vehemently disagree. Yes. <laughs> uh, so for those of you that are familiar with the Bitbucket interface, GitLab is a great option for you. 
my preference is and always has been GitHub. It's the first one I ever used. Uh, wh whenever I have to point somebody to tutorial on s generating SSH keys, I point them at the GitHub one. Uh, they just have a great culture. I'm a bit of a fanboy. I have GitHub mm -hmm. pint glasses. I have <laughs> get, like a, a pile of 50 of the GitHub Octocat stickers. Um, yeah, a little bit. A little bit of a fan, uh, but there, there's one feature that GitHub offers that I have not seen in GitLab or Bitbucket, and you can start a review. So it, you can go through all the code, leave all of your comments, and then submit your review, and the author of that code gets one email, one notification with all the comments, not one email per mm, comment, that is nice. or all those within like the last 10, 15 minutes. And until somebody else implements that or does something better, GitHub, hands down, that absolutely nice. my favorite. I will have to try GitLab, though, because that one I haven't tried. Right. And you know somebody that works at GitLab, too. Oh, really? We'll talk. Oh, about wait, it. hold on. I don't know if you ever met him. Okay. You worked with somebody that now works at GitLab. Okay. <laughs> he and I are friends, but I don't know if you two ever uh, needed to interact. Uh, but yeah, so thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, I hope you, you got a good feel for who we are and what we want to do here. And hopefully yeah. we inspired you to email us about something. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have some social media coming up. Uh, yes. We're going to have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, so you can definitely interact with us there. Uh, yep. But for now, namespace.pod at gmail.com yep. is how you can get in touch. If there's any topics you want to hear about, let us know. If there's anything you disagreed with, uh, let us know. Or agreed with. If you just really agreed and you want to let us know. Yeah, we, we'd appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but thanks for hanging out. We're going to catch you next yeah. time. Oh, and also, um, you can find us on pretty much any of the main podcast platforms that you stream, but also YouTube. We're on YouTube, so check out, um, you know, any any of those platforms podcast or youtube youtube social media is still inbound but we will be there <laughs> <laughs> yes all right well thank you for tuning in